ago, I was the sole owner-operator of a lawn maintenance business. It was a long, a long time ago, um, back when what little hair I had left and a goatee was still dark, and, uh, you know, I didn't have all the aches and pains. I was in my 20s and, and, and moving into my 30s, but I was the owner-operator of a lawn maintenance uh, company, and it kept me in shape pretty good, but during the busy season, I was working 10 to 12-hour days. I mean, the demand was pretty uh, hot and heavy. I mean, it's hot season down in South Florida. The last thing I wanted was somebody coming up to me while I'm operating equipment, working hard, already got a long day, and for them to stop me and try to have a conversation. I mean, that's the last thing I need. I'm, I'm going against the clock here. And, you know, most times I could go into a place and, and get the job done and leave and everything would be fine. But there was one particular house that I learned to dread because the guy uh, was retired, which is fine, God bless him, and, but I would, I would show up and he had plenty of time on his hands and he would come out of the house and I'd go, oh, here we go, and he, you know, he'd, he'd engage me in conversation so I'd have to stop what I was doing and what should have been like a 30-minute job would end up being 45 minutes, an hour. I'm going to get home later. It's all, I'm already dying out here with this humidity and heat. But I'll tell you what, you know, it's not, I know it doesn't sound too spiritual to tell you that my reaction was not holy, you know. I mean, I tried to smile and, and have a conversation, but inside I was really irritated. I would leave, whenever that would happen, and it happened often, whenever I would leave, I would drive off and I'd be angry and I'd be talking to God going, you know, seriously, God. I mean, I'm trying to get a job done and this guy just keeps coming out talking to me. Yeah, so like the Lord impressed on my heart over time, hey, um, maybe, maybe, you know, thick head boy, maybe uh, I put that guy in your life. And maybe he doesn't know Jesus. And maybe it's an opportunity to share the gospel with a guy. Maybe engage him in conversation. And so God began to change my perspective to where then I was like, okay, Lord, fine. And trust me, it was a faith step to say, all right, God, if he comes out of the house, I'll assume it's an opportunity from you. And I'll joyfully stop and have a conversation with a guy. So I did that. God tested me. But he kind of stopped coming out as much. I don't think the guy knew Jesus. But here's the, here's the thing. What was God doing through this guy in my life? I was young, impatient, not saying I've grown a whole lot in that regard. But what was God doing through this guy? God was beginning to teach me to embrace inconvenience for the sake of the glory of Jesus Christ. That's something to learn. It doesn't come naturally to embrace inconvenience for the sake of Christ. So let me ask you, are you willing to be inconvenienced in any way for Jesus? That's the question today. As we read the story of Joseph, and we're going to continue that in just a moment, but one thing becomes really clear. God was in charge of his life, and it was the will of the Lord for Joseph to be inconvenienced. Time after time after time. And God did not necessarily give Joseph the privilege of knowing why he was inconveniencing him. It was just happening. So today we're going to look at three ways to respond when we are inconvenienced for Jesus. Now we're going to read some scripture today. I hope you're all right with that. And if you're not, take a nap. Genesis chapter 40, starting with verse 1. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. 
they continued for some time in custody. Then one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So these guys have dreams, they, they think there are, there are some significance to those dreams, and they want an answer on what the dreams mean. Verse 9, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said, in my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three day or days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Now pause for a second and understand what the job of the cupbearer was. It was his job to bring in the fresh grapes, and in the presence of the Pharaoh, so he could be assured that he wasn't being poisoned, he to crush the grapes, to make the juice, to make, and, and, and you know, make sure, here we go, here's your, here's your drink. And the Pharaoh somehow got ticked off at him and put him in prison. He was there for a while. He has a dream. And the answer to the dream is, you're going to be restored. That's good news. And verse 14, only remember me, Joseph says, when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. So the cupbearer was a very trusted position, a very honored position, a very important position in Pharaoh's court. I mean, that's a guy that if he was bribed, he could poison the king, the king. I mean, he, was, he had to be a very trusted person, and so Joseph's trying to take advantage of the political moment and say, hey, dude, could you please remember me when you get in front of Pharaoh again? Things are going well. Will you please remember me? I want to get out of here. I did nothing, he said. Verse 15, I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. Here also I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. That is, you know, and now I'm in prison. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw the interpretation was favorable... He said to Joseph, well, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And you can just see, by the way, a baker coming from uh, you know, where the ovens are and putting the bread stacked in the baskets and carrying it across the courtyard and, and people trying to keep the birds out of the baskets, right? I mean, it's a, it's a dream that would have made... Uh, there would have been a familiar, have, have familiar elements to it, to this guy. So he says, hey, there were birds eating out of it, verse 17, out of the basket on my head, verse 18. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. He's going to lop your head off and then hang your body on a gibbet, is basically what he's telling him. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. Isn't that pleasant? Let's all pray, say amen, and go home. Let's go to lunch. Okay. Verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief, chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. And let's hold on to verse 23 for just a little bit. But we're looking at three ways to respond when we are inconvenienced for Jesus. Write this down in your notes if you would. We must respond with faithful service. We must respond with faithful service when inconvenienced for Jesus. You'll remember that Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. And we'll see here in just a few minutes over in chapter 41, verse 46, that Joseph was 30 years old when he was raised to overseer in Egypt. 
This means he had 13 long years in the wilderness of slavery and prison. 13 long years. It was silence from God on the reason why all this was happening. Certainly God was with him. And Joseph knew what it was like to keep serving faithfully even when he was in the dark regarding the purpose of God. He had the Lord's presence, but he had no idea what God was actually doing in his life. When he was 17 years old and he had the, the dreams of, of being raised up over his brothers and his family, and his brothers ended up hating him. And when he was put into a pit and then sold into slavery, when he served for years as a, as a household slave, when he was sexually harassed by the master's wife, when he was lied about, thrown into prison, he didn't know the reason why any of it was happening. For 13 years, he had no idea. Why is all this calamity happening to me? God's presence is with me. I know he's with me. I know he has not abandoned me. I mean, we've, we saw last week, God was with him and blessed him and used him for his glory. He was with him. And so Joseph had the sense of God's presence, but God never, we never read up to this point, God saying, and this is why. And yet Joseph, no matter the context he finds himself in, continues to serve faithfully, though inconvenienced, time after time regardless of his circumstances. We're told that Jesus is faithful in service to God. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 put it, puts it this way. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But listen, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. In other words, Jesus is the faithful Son of God who serves faithfully even through inconvenience. And we, as his household, are to not quit. We're to hold tightly to, cling closely to Jesus. In talking about being inconvenienced, the passage in Philippians 2, I just have to share it and remind you of it, even though it's familiar to you. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. You might put in there some brackets. He, on purpose, chose to inconvenience himself. He took a form of a servant. Joseph didn't choose it, but Jesus did. He was born in the likeness of men. He was found in human form. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So you've got Joseph learning to, to faithfully serve when inconvenienced and not told why. And then we see in the New Testament that what Moses wrote about was really about Jesus, who was a faithful son, who chose to be inconvenienced. For the glory of God. And so we cling closely to him. Jesus was inconvenienced in faithful service to God for you. So the, back to the original question today. Are you willing to be inconvenienced for Jesus? Is there a line in the sand where you say this much but no more? The Lord may not give you a hint of the reasons why certain things are going on in your life, or even what he's doing in the circumstances of your life. He may not tell you why or what he's doing, but are you willing to faithfully serve him anyway? Let's get really practical. One of the, one of the many blessings this church has is the reality that there are a lot of people who are willing to serve faithfully. That is something that God has done in this church. And what a blessing it is. I mean, it really is. But there's more to do. There's more to do. You can't rest on what has been. You can't rest on your resume of, well, I used to. Now, you, may not have, you may not go back and do what you used to do. You might. But it may be that God has something else He wants you to do. Are you at the place in your life where you're saying, hey, I got a line in the sand here. I'm tired and I don't want to do that. And God's saying, why not? 
It may be that God actually wants to inconvenience you for Jesus' sake. Are you willing to say yes? And there's plenty to do for His kingdom in the church, beyond the church, outside the walls. There's plenty to do. Is there something that the Lord is calling you up to that will benefit others, helping the functionality of this church, impacting others for Christ's sake? So the challenge is tell the Lord yes. Yes. <laughs> Have the demeanor of yes. No line in the sand. Just kind of mess that up. Get the line just all blurred and just say, God, you know what? You know what you want for me. You know every day that you're going to give me on planet Earth. I'm assuming I've got a lot to go, but maybe I don't. So what? you know what? Every, every day is a gift. So whatever you want today, whatever you want for the tomorrows, here I am. Here I am. We don't need more days, weeks, or months of contemplating God's will. We don't need another focus group trying to figure out what God wants to do. He's revealed enough <laughs> to where we can stand up and get active and do what He's already told us very clearly He wants us to do as His people. It's not, it's not for a lack of clarity. It's an issue of obedience. Are we willing to commit to faithful servants, uh, service when inconvenienced for Jesus? So we're looking at three ways to respond when we're inconvenienced for Jesus. First of all, we must respond when faithful serv uh, with faithful service. And secondly, we must respond with faith-filled patience. Write that down if you would. We must respond with faith-filled patience when inconvenienced for Jesus. I didn't forget about that lonely little verse 23 in chapter 40. Go back and look at it, if you would, please. Chapter 40, verse 23 says, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Look at verse 1 of, of chapter 41. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And we'll continue the story there in a moment. But I want you to imagine this with me. The hopes of Joseph are stirred up as he knows the chief cupbearer is going to be restored to Pharaoh. And he asks the chief cupbearer, verse 14 of chapter 40, will you remember me? I, I shouldn't be in prison. Will you remember me to the Pharaoh? Will you help me get out of here? In the last verse, verse 23, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. And then it was two more years. Chapter 41, verse 1. Two more after two more years. Two full years. Good night, man. I mean, can you imagine the disappointment? I mean, Joseph had to be thinking when the cupbearer got out of prison, this is awesome. The cupbearer is going to put in a good word for me to the Pharaoh. My time in prison is almost done. This is wonderful. And God keeps him there two more years in prison. He forgot about him. Not God, but this cupbearer. Two whole years. Man, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Oh, he kept faithfully serving, like we said in the first point. But it had to be a disappointment. He had to learn faith-filled patience. He had to keep trusting in the Lord. You know, he must have been sick when those days turned into years, waiting on the hopes of being released. Now, what did he do as he lived in the inconvenient circumstances of prison for two more years? Well, apparently he waited with faith-filled patience. Because when he was finally called on, he was still walking with God. And he was still ready. He wasn't bitter. He didn't say, ah, forget about it. Figure out your own dream, you idiot. He was still walking with God. He had learned to have his faith filled up in his own spirit before the Lord and just walk patiently with God. And so that when the time was right, as we'll see in a few minutes, he was ready. Let me ask you a question. Are you in an extended season of undesirable circumstances? Have you hoped that things would change, but the time of your difficulty keeps dragging on? Have you been searching for answers, but God doesn't clue you in on how long it will be until you experience deliverance? You've got to learn 
faith-filled patience. That's a tough thing to learn. It really is. You know, Paul wrote about the many ways the apostles were inconvenienced for Christ. In 1 Corinthians 4, starting with verse 9, he writes this, I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade condemned to die. We become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools, but you claim to be so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honored, but we are ridiculed. Even now we go hungry and thirsty. We don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We're often beaten and have no home. We work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. He goes on to write, we are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage, garbage, like everyone's trash, right up to the present moment. (laughs) The Apostle Paul writes, and what's he saying? Hey, we're willing to be inconvenienced for Christ. We are. God's called us to this, and we're willing for it to happen. We don't like it. We don't like it one bit. But it's part of what God has called us to do, and we are going to do it by the grace of God. Do you have a line in the sand? How much are you willing to be inconvenienced for Christ? I think of missionaries across the world who are so inconvenienced for Jesus... And really can't share really how they feel a lot of times. Because people back home wouldn't understand. People who are supporting them. You really can't share the struggles of missionary life. The things that they battle. The things that they face. The things that they fear. The criticism they receive. Even from people back home who don't understand. When they go on a vacation. You know, just all sorts of things that happen. And yet, there, we, you know, thousands of people just in the Southern Baptist Convention choose to live in a lifestyle that is inconvenienced for Jesus. And that's awesome. Are you in a wilderness of waiting and in an extended time of disappointment and dashed hopes? Has God got you in an inconvenient time in your life? James 5, 7 and 8 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. In other words, in the present time, just relax in in the presence of Christ. As you're serving Him, just faithfully serve with a patient spirit. I got this little book, and my wife saw my quote from it and posted it today, but this is, I don't know which one of us kids when we were young scribbled in my dad's book, but one of us did. This is an old book, and this was when my dad used to be in ministry, he had this book. It's written by Vance Havner, it's a daily devotional, that's his signature in the page there. But in this book, Vance Havner writes, it is a mark of unbelief, not of faith, when we uneasily look around us and keep reminding God that we are depending on, on Him. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you, God, in this. I'm, I'm, I'm really depending on you. He goes on to say, we are trusting Him more when instead of constantly reminding Him, we move on to do the next thing and the next, counting it all as good as done. A father would be grieved if his child kept on asking, are you sure you're going to take care of me? A trusting child goes on about other things and wastes no time trying to trust his father. You are really not trusting until you quit trying, Havner writes. The more you examine your faith, the sicklier it will be. Don't look at your faith, look unto Jesus. End quote. I think that's pretty good advice. Look to Jesus. Are you looking to Jesus, responding in faith-filled patience, trusting God, though inconvenienced for Christ? So today we're looking at three ways to respond. When inconvenienced for Jesus, respond in faithful service, respond in faith-filled patience, when inconvenienced for Jesus. Thirdly and lastly, write this down if you would, we must respond with focused determination when inconvenienced for Jesus. Focused determination. In verse 1 of chapter 41, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. 
There was a period of my life that I kind of resembled that, by the way. I lost a little weight. Anyway, and they fed in the reed grass, and behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. Verse 4, and the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk, and behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh has a dream, he has a dream, he has two dreams, really. And they work in tandem, one with the other. One is of cows, and one is of corn. Plump corn, blighted corn. Fat cows, skinny cows, really weird dreams. But he has these dreams and they're very vivid to him. And he's thinking, little G, the gods must have given me this dream. And I want to know what the little G gods are trying to tell me. And so he goes to his wise men and, hey, I've had these dreams, so help me understand what the gods are trying to tell me. I mean, Pharaoh didn't believe in the one true God, right? And they can't help him. They can't help him. I mean, they didn't even try to lie to him and come up with something that sounded good. They were just like, hey, we really don't know on this one. Look down at verse number 9. Then the chief cupbearer said, oh, good. Good to see you back, chief cupbearer. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. We dreamed on the same night, he and I each having a dream with his own interpretation. Verse 12, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged. So finally the cupbearer mentions Joseph to Pharaoh at an opportune time. So we're glad to see that. Look down at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when, they had sha when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Of course, Joseph then gives credit to God. It is not in me, verse 16. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Look down at verse 25 through 36. After, right after Pharaoh recounts the dreams to Joseph, verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Not little g, but the God. <laughs> the God in heaven. The one true God has actually revealed to the Pharaoh. That's why your false uh, you know, interpreters couldn't actually come up with the interpretation. Because it's the God of heaven who's given this to you. So verse 25, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Verse 26, the seven good cows are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears, blighted by the east wind, are also seven years. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them there will, there will arise seven years of famine. And all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow it, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, the, now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so the land may not perish through the famine. So Joseph turns Pharaoh's attention to the one true God as he interprets the dream and he makes the application 
hey, the, dream, the dreams are one, really. It is settled by God that he's going to do this. There's going to be a great time of abundance, seven years. There's going to be a great time of famine that immediately follows that. And the whole known world is going to feel this famine. And the seven fat years are going to provide for the seven lean years. And you've got to get somebody in place, Pharaoh, that can help oversee and manage the collection of food during those seven years. And then the distribution of the food in those seven lean years. Look down at verse 37. And we're going to go ahead and read the story, okay? So just follow along. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Remember some dreams that Joseph had when he was 17? We're kind of moving toward the fulfillment of those dreams, aren't we? Verse 42, Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him with garments of fine linen, put a gold chain about his neck, and he made him ride in his second chariot. What a scene. And they called out before him, Bow the knee, Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphonath Paneah. Say that three times quickly as you spin about. And he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. He was 30 years old. So Joseph gets put second in command over all of Egypt, authority only second to Pharaoh. Pharaoh gives him the daughter of a priest in marriage. And as you read along, you can see that he has two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And you can see in verse 53, it begins the fulfillment of what God had said through the dreams and interpreted by Joseph. The fat years and then the lean years. In verse 55, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Now look at this, verse 57, moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. So what we'll see next time is that his family ends up coming down to Egypt. Now I want you to step, step out of this story for just a second, come above it and look down on it and understand what's going on here is that years earlier, God had started this whole process in motion to bring Joseph up to this point because he was going to fulfill what he told Abraham. This land, this land of promise is going to be yours and your descendants, but not for another 400 years. You're going to go down into Egypt and then after that you're going to come out And those descendants will have the land of the Amorites. Why? Because because the sin of the Amorites is not yet fulfilled. So they got 400 more years of grace, essentially. And so years earlier, God had said that to Abraham. But how does he get his people, how does God get his people to actually come down into Egypt? See, God had it all planned. There was a bigger redemptive story going on in the backdrop. And then God was going to deliver them out of Egypt, which, by the way, wasn't just limited to that story itself. It was actually looking forward to out of Egypt... I have called my son, which really looks to Jesus, who also went down into Egypt as an infant and was brought back back up out of Egypt because that's really what it was looking to. It's all about Jesus. All of this is about Jesus. Everything written the four time, the New Testament writer says, was written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come. So we look at a story like this today, we get practical application, we understand, hey, inconvenience and all that, but the reality is this all makes us look at Jesus. He fulfills every bit of this, every shadow that we see pointing forward to a Messiah figure. It all finds its culmination and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But we come back to the story, and what do we see? 
We see this guy who is used to faithfully serving even when it's inconvenient, when he's inconvenienced and God doesn't tell him the why or the what. And he's put in second command over all Egypt, married, two sons. And he, what does he do? He enacts the plan of storing food for the coming famine. Here's the thing. No matter what the circumstance that he found himself in, whenever there was a job needing to be done, and it was assigned to Joseph as his responsibility, whether it was in the master's house, whether it was in prison, or whether he was second in command of overall Egypt, or way back when he was in his father's household, he always performed the tasks adequately and even with excellence. He had focused determination to get whatever task he was assigned to accomplished and done well. One of my goals, no matter where I go in ministry or in life, is to finish well. That's why I told you last week and gave you a two-month notice. Why? Because I'm not, I'm not slinking around in the shadows. I love you as your pastor. I love you, and I want to serve you all the way up to the very last day. I want to love you. And that's the attitude we're supposed to have no matter what circumstance. Why? Because Jesus did that. And he calls us to it. Every one of us. He wants us to finish well and, and, and perform excellently in whatever environment he puts us in. He wants us to have focused determination to serve him well. Whether slave or prison, Joseph served with focused determination. When he was in charge over, second in charge over all Egypt, he served the same way with focused determination. It's just who he learned to be. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, If you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest in the greater responsibilities. I was trying to set up insurance for January because i got to have an insurance change. I'm talking to the insurance agent, and it comes to find, come to find out, because of how I answered one of my questions, he, he, I was going to be knocked out of, my wife was going to be knocked out of one of the preferred uh, options. And so he tried to lead me into lying. Well, now, if you just say, da, 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 do you hear what I'm saying? Blah, 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 blah. He was willing to commit fraud against his own company that he was working for to get his sale. I called him out on it. Because if you're, if you're not faithful in the little things, you're not going to be faithful in the big things. So when you as a church task me with this, that, or the other, I want to be faithful even in the little things. Church gives me a debit card to use. Well, I want to use it for ministry, and I do. And you can look at any, any receipt I've ever used, which haven't, hasn't really been much, actually. I want to be faithful in the little things. You want to be faithful in the little things. Why? Because Jesus is faithful in the little things, and he calls us to faithfulness. Let me ask you, are you waiting for the big things? For the important responsibilities to come your way? Before you put your wholehearted effort into serving, learn to be faithful with focused determination when inconvenienced for Jesus. Even in the little details of life, no matter what the circumstances are, whatever you find yourself in, whether in prison like Joseph, in slavery like Joseph, or second in command like Joseph, in other words, positions of lowliness or, or great responsibility, be faithful in the little things in honor of Christ, no matter the circumstance, and do it with focused determination. Do the right thing. It's always right to do the right thing. By the way, that influences everything I do, including my politics, even when people get mad at me. By the way, temptation of Jesus. Remember that? One way that the devil tried to tempt Jesus was to sin, to take a shortcut on the job God sent him to do. Remember that? Matthew chapter 4, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. In other words, the devil was offering to Jesus to give him the authority over all the nations. The devil thought mistakenly that was in his power to give because he was the prince and power of the air, right? And so he got a little too big for his britches like he always does, and he was at, offering to Jesus, tell you what, 
You don't have to go to the cross. Let's shortchange that. Let's go around this way and I'll give you all the authority over the nations. And all you got to do is just bow, bow one time. That's it. Hey, you know what? Take a shortcut. You'll have all the authority. I'll give it to you. And Jesus would certainly be given all authority in heaven and on earth, but it's going to be given to him by his Father as he finished the job he was sent to do. Getting all authority in heaven and on earth was not done by taking a shortcut. It was by going to the cross. It was by going to a cold stone tomb, by resurrecting from the dead. And then Jesus is given all authority in heaven and on earth. So therefore, go and make disciples. He's given us the authority to go and serve Him and make disciples. And He, he calls us to take up our cross and follow Him. Let me ask you a quick question. Was the cross inconvenient for Jesus? Was it? The instrument of death, was that, in, was that inconvenient? Of course it was. What was the metaphor Jesus used? Count the cost, take up your cross... And follow me. Choose the instrument of difficulty and death. <laughs> Choose the inconvenience. Find out what the inconvenience is that I want you to do. And then do it. And do it daily. Persistently. With focused determination. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. We take up our convenience and follow our own whims and desires. That's not biblical Christianity. And by the way, I'm tempted with the same thing. The cross and the empty grave provided the pathway to glory, not shortchanging the task for which Jesus was sent. Jesus didn't call us to sacrifice for self-advancement. He called us to self-sacrifice for the advancement of the gospel. Joseph did not go seeking political advancement in Pharaoh's court. But it was the predetermined plan of God set in motion 13 years earlier to result in the salvation of his chosen people. God had that in mind all along. There was no way for Joseph to know it in advance, but God knew it in advance and that was enough. He had planned the course of events and he was leading Joseph through those course of events and he wasn't telling Joseph what he was doing. And you're living your life going, God, what are you doing? And God may say, well, this is what I'm doing. And he may say, none yet. I'm the dad. You just do what I tell you to do. You ever had a kid who'd ask you questions, just hound you and want to know everything? Sometimes a parent just says, none of your business. God does the same thing. I want you to think about Joseph for just a second. One night he goes to bed in the prison, and he doesn't know that the next morning he's going to be awakened told to shave, put on these new clothes, and that that day he was going to be put second in command over all Egypt. But God knew. God had prepared him for that very day. Who plans these sorts of things? God does. God's got your life planned too. The Lord is in charge of your life just like he was in charge of Joseph's life. Joseph wanted to be faithful. He wanted to serve the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. So in chapter 41, we just read through there, most of it. And what do we see come to the surface? The godly character of a man who had focused determination on the job. I'm going to do what God has put in my life, whether it's slave, prison, or in the court. I'm going to do what God has put in my life today. What is it that God is calling you to? To be inconvenienced for Jesus. Are you serving excellently? Are you glorifying God to the maximum with your life? I'm not sure if we ever get there, but is that your goal? A little over 13 years ago, I asked God to do whatever he wanted to in my life to make me maximally usable for his glory and his kingdom purpose. I asked him to do that in me. I asked him to do that in my wife, and he led us to come to Oklahoma. I didn't know the details of what that was going to look like. And here we are 13 years later about to head back, sorry folks, but what I consider home. And no idea 
what God was going to do. And God has not really been, you know, of a mind to let me know along the way exactly what's going on at any given moment. I've been in the school of learning what he began to teach me with that one guy outside <laughs> with a lawnmower. If I want to inconvenience you, I can. And I will. And I might not share with you why or what. But you do it anyway. Jesus may not lead you into slavery or prison, but what inconvenience is he calling you to for his kingdom advancement, for his glory, his purpose in this time and place? Are you willing to serve with focused determination, patiently waiting in faith, and faithfully serving until the coming of the Lord? We end with Jesus. Jesus was inconvenienced for you. Are you willing to be inconvenienced for him?